go to the Q&A here now. And um, I'm going to open the floor kind of wide open. We've got a lot of great speakers up here and one microphone. So maybe you can kind of put your, your hand up. I'll give you the mic. And then I'm going to run back to the speakers and let them talk. So. Shannon, you spoke about it, uh, how things are changing in business and how consumers are actually changing their demands. And there's definitely a, a switch because of how we've actually grown our food and, and processed it from seed to plate. What are your observations as far as you guys spoke about sustainability, you know, the all the packaging that you're minimizing? So a lot of people with gluten, you know, allergies and intolerances, all that's coming up for diners and things like that. I would love all of your opinions or whoever's most inspired to talk about how you're actually addressing the whole sustainability and health issue that's coming up because of the fact that we haven't actually really taken care of our planet and our bodies with the way we process foods. Last year we, uh, we went into the river water what you guys carry it right now. Uh, we used to average one and a half containers a month, a box of orders. Each container will have uh, what, about 1,500 cases, plant 12, and we eliminated that with one shot. So the amount of recycling alone, now forget about the recycling, it's, this container had to go on a ship, come, through the, come from Italy through the Mediterranean to the Atlantic, get dropped in the East Coast, goes on train, come all the way down here. And it, it's a massive for the environment. So we switched on that last uh, last year, and that's one of the things we do. Uh, from a from a from a business perspective, I mean, our goal is to make our customer happy every single day. Sometimes people will look at the menu and say, "Well, I'm a mission carry. Uh, just pick up the phone and call me." It's a yes. It is a steak house, and we have a fridge, 20 by 20, and every cut of meat is hanging in. But we'll cook you vegetarian food if you want. Our job is to make the customers happy. And that's something we're always trying. Got to a point that sometime we do it and the chefs get a tiny bit irritated, but now but I, I try to calm them down. We have three restaurants on one block, fifteen feet apart. Get customers walking in to black and blue, ordering sushi from coast. And pasta from the Italian kitchen. And we have to see our waiters running across the street with the trays. And the chef said, looking at me, said, like, there's nothing on my menu that they couldn't like that I have to go for. So let's look after the customer, make them happy. So when you talk about sensibilities or we talk about the product that we have, we, we definitely try to have lots of relationship with local products. But because of the massive operation that we do, big times that we cannot support the amount of operation that we do. Uh, I would get uh, Steve have his own boats and he would call me in the morning, send me a, a picture of the, the 100 pound halibut that he just caught. Well, there's not too many restaurants that go to a 100 pound of halibut. Uh, Coast will take it and we will use it in three hours. So I say to him, can you get me two? Uh, well, Iman, I just got one. So we go through that, but we still have to go out, outside of our resources to try to keep that massive machine going. Okay. Yeah, I'll pass it through. So we, it's a something that we're always we're very aware of, and we take it day by day, try to make the customers happy. It, it is a big deal. It's, it's, it's really changing the way we do things, especially when we're right down to the farm level. And that's one of the reasons that when we were uh, looking at this, Biogas plant makes a lot of sense to us because um, one of the things that restaurants and households, and when you're dealing with food, um, there's food waste, there's peels, there's uh, food that doesn't get eaten, and all those types of things. And right now, they're filling our landfills. And, uh, the biogas plant is one way that we are helping. Uh, we're finding that we can be sustainable and making a full circle. That gas, those noxious gases, are normally just. Um, evaporating into the air, and now we are pumping them back and burning them to actually. We have the opportunity now to use our own gas through our relationship with Fortis to cook our own chips. Just uh, from a consumer point of view, one of our uh, clients is Silver Hills Bakery, um, but the gluten free trend is a massive trend right now. It is the highest grossing trend by far. Uh, it's still, it still represents a small portion, uh, maybe about 2 3%, maybe of a uh, same larger categories, but 
it's a massive issue. And what happens is you get consumers that have buy food for, for one family member, but it's not like they buy double up. Uh, they'll buy that one food free product and then the rest of the family just has to eat it. So even though only, um, and actually this is probably a very interesting point here, is uh, we're starting to only say one out of every 144 person is say gluten free or celiac. But what you have is that there's been a lot of uh, research in proteins of wheat. And what before is that it used to be called pest control, and you would then genetically engineer certain proteins that pests wouldn't want. But yet they're finding that maybe 7% of the population can't digest it easily. So you have people that are gluten sensitive, but not necessarily celiac, and that's going to be a massively growing trend. So if you are in the food industry, if, you, if you're not seriously considering gluten free as a part of your strategy, you need to start. I am gluten free, by the way. Something I just thought, just thought of like a month, a month and a half ago, and 26 oh pounds. Really? You're telling me that? We don't worry about it yet. But. So, uh, next question. I just want to know where the name Roaring Twenties came from. Steve is no longer in his. I'm still in my Roaring Twenties. So when we started, we were. 27, 28, or 28, 29, whatever it was. Yeah, 28, 29. And so that was that was our last kick in the can to make a stamp that might last some longer than our 20s. And it was it was kind of a, a nod at um, at that, and us having a lot of fun figuring things out. And that was the palette that we were going with at the time. So we still are, and uh, I'm still in my 20s. Thank God. Of course, Steve's over the hill now. So I might. I think my default. Papers that we signed, I get more of the company now. Uh, but actually, I think it also kind of transcended into this hood. This neighborhood is, is really iconic for that era, um, especially in the rum running and whiskey trade. Um, this building was built in 1923. And also, I guess the, the last one is that's a pretty cool era in the sense that people were celebrating, you know. And, People weren't working corporate jobs anymore, and I think Vancouver is, is kind of like that in a sense. Um, as we, everyone is, is, it's a cool city to be in. It's a really like fun, energetic city, and everyone works a lot of cool jobs here. So it's not like Toronto per se, or a more corporate town. So um, that's just that air, that mood and that feeling was was kind of something we wanted to bring to life again. And I know it's sad, but we're all going to be in our roaring twenties in about seven years. So our generation. For, for me, it's always about um, talking to people about the relationship with food. Uh, chocolate's kind of interesting in the sense that it brings up more guilt than it does in a lot of things, and it's a very real thing that people often feel guilty when they eat chocolate. And so there's kind of a, a misconception. So it, it's really about you know having a proper relation with food. Uh, to me, it's, it's just really, so that, that's what I would talk about. I, I would give my time to anybody who and I, it's, it's a known fact uh, that uh, I get emails all year long of students that they want a uh, business or other that they just want to sit down with me and I'll, I'll make the time. I always make the time. I find the time somehow. So uh, if they contact, I'll always make the time. Might not be next week, but I'll always make the time. Four and a half years ago, I moved here from Toronto, and one of the first things I did as a photographer was shoot the 100 month things to eat before you die for Vancouver Magazine. And I'm 95% sure you had chocolates in it. Because I remember going to your place before and I know the crackers were in it. So if you could pick one thing in Vancouver to eat before you die, what would it be? Let's start here. I'd like Greg to cover one of my chips chocolate. <laughs> You know, I think that if anybody has ever, uh, like let's say, uh, coast, for example, you have their muscles, so it's, uh, you have to try it. Uh, I'm, sure, I'm not sure if you guys do that. It's excellent. So. Um, I would do uh, car service at White Spot with the <laughs> back seats of my truck with my kids, and we watch a movie, and they slide the tray in, and I would have a bacon and cheese burger with fries. <laughs> well, 
My husband and I are always trying to get Tojo to do the puff and fish. And so one day we will get him to prepare the fish. It's very, very hard to find a chef that will actually do that. Um, for me, I would actually throw it back at the hard bite guys. And one of my favorite things when you open a bag of chips is when you get the one that's doubled over. Oh, yeah. So when you when you put it in your mouth, it's like double crunch. <laughs> if I could get a full bag, it would have to be hand selected, I'm sure, but that would be an absolute highlight. Uh, how do I top that? Really? Add some ice cream or something, maybe? I think after we bottle for the next three days, 16 hours a day, maybe we'll take a couple bottles of wine over to Black and Blue and get those guys to make us something with our Melbac. Okay, perfect. Did you guys hear that? <laughs> Come and visit me at the fish shack. I'm not leaving the fish shack. Yeah, that's once. right. <laughs> okay, we can take you to the fish shack. Okay. Um, I have some pretty simple tastes, but uh, my, one of my favorite things to absolutely lead is a uh, baguette, sourdough baguette from Terra Breads, slathered in butter and jam, and dipped in uh, a good latte. And it's just, to me, that's just, that's just so funny. Hello, just for the hard bite guys. Um, I fell in love with your chips because I was in an in-store demo and I talked about the Himalayan sea salt that was in it. And I noticed in the new packaging, it's not there anymore, it's listed. Um, is that going to change the back at all or stick with just regular sea salt? Uh, yeah, we, we actually had the Himalayan debate. Uh, how many people here know what Himalayan crystallized salt is? Because you guys are foodies. <laughs> Gosh, it is, it is actually a very good salt. Um, one of the, and I'm going to let you in on a, on a bit of it inside. One of the issues with Himalayan crystallized salt is that it's very expensive salt. And the one good thing about it is that you don't need to use as much of it, though, in the application to create that same type of uh, savory type of flavor with it. Uh, however, when we, when we first came in, we realized that. Um, for about a year, not every package was actually using Himalayan crystallized salt, even though it was being advertised for them, right? <gasps> no. So what we said is that we obviously you can't do that, and uh, and so we we went through a lot, and we actually did some a lot of surveys, and 95% of our consumer base didn't really know what it was, and it was extremely expensive, and so if we wanted to keep the price down of the chips at the shelf. In order to sell more bags, we had to help, we had to find ways to help decrease cost without sacrificing quality. And so we did a number of different tests on that, and we felt that using a very high-end sea salt um, still preserved the quality aspects of it. Um, but it is something that we debated for a long time. Because personally, Himalayan crystallized salt is like premium salt. But if you if you we felt people wouldn't pay 450 for a 150 gram bag, uh, and that was and that's just the reality of it right now. You never seen Himalayan salt come to black and blue. The whole meat cooler is made by salt, by the way. Himalayan salt. Yeah. And it, it is extremely, extremely, extremely expensive. For the winery guys, uh, what's been your biggest challenge this past year? Steve and I still have found a way to own, own the good majority of this whole company, and that's been a really big challenge. Um, this, we're really fortunate. The place you're in right now is the way you see it, we just had to do some production facade stuff and it's still a friends and family build up. It really is, like we spent this whole, our lives here just getting to look the way it is. When Matt talks about lighting and stuff, and I sit here and I go, God, we probably spent a month <laughs> grand in proper lighting, but proper sound, but like actually the things that make a place special, we need to do that eventually, but we're, we've been working so hard to keep what we're doing, um, in our own hands and then our own sort of destiny. So it's been work on a shoestring budget. So that probably, we feel like we've got more gray hair than we should have these days. But um, I think when you run a company really, really lean, you, you make decisions on based on the need to have, not the nice to have. And so um, we also have two other partners that are extremely important to us in the way we make decisions and completely, uh, they're certainly, um, uh, mentors to us every single day. So 
I think the hardest thing has been running a lean, lean ship with big aspirations. So every week we know we've got to do, we've got to, we want to improve, we want to get better, we want the experience to be better. Um, we just opened it up for the public, so Thursdays and Fridays here, the tasting bar is rammed. Like it gets busier and busier, and it's really, really fun. It's a great place to come visit. Um, the staff is amazing, but as you know, as you get busier in the restaurant industry, we never treated this place like a restaurant, we treated it like a tasting bar which is more casual and it's experiential and it's more informative. Well, when you have more people coming in the door, you cannot just keep acting like it's a casual little tasting bar. That you have to be constantly on your toes and what that means is you've got to be like, make do with what you have, but also make the right investments in the right places. And um, when you do that with a lean budget, it's always a, a huge challenge. <laughs> yeah, I think Mike touched on a lot of the same points I would say, but um, to add to that, you know, we started Wine on Tap. It's a brand new category in Canada. Nobody had really ventured down it yet. Um, we had to learn it from scratch. So we spent a lot of time traveling through the U.S. and traveling through the largest four packagers in the U.S. of Wine on Tap, Wine and Stainless Steel kegs, and. We learned it from nothing. Mike and I don't come from a winemaking background, we come from a wine drinking background. <laughs> Helps. So, you know, it's been a huge challenge over the last year to really understand the industry and forecast our growth in a brand new category. And a lot of people sitting up here and a lot of people in this room have experienced that and you know how that feels. You're forecasting numbers into a black abyss and constantly trying to update those monthly and stay on top of your business is a real big challenge. So, you know, for me, outside of what Mike said, our other big challenge is um, growing as fast as the market wants to grow and keeping up with that growth. And then staff challenges, having the right people. People make your business. It's, you know, we pride ourselves on hiring exceptionally amazing people. And we have an amazing staff of almost 20 now. And uh, we hope they're with us for a really long time. So. You know, staff is always a big challenge of small business, but you know, treat them well and and pat them on the back as much as you can, and hopefully they stick around with you. Important tip, really quick for each of you: don't don't let your ambition run ahead of your uh, ability. So you know, make sure that you have a very good differentiated position, so that you don't just create a me too product. Really going to find out is this really different in the market and will people actually pay for it? I would say that it has to be something you're passionate about because if it's not your passion and not your love and not um, something that you would give up everything for, um, the amount of hours and work and stress and headache that it takes in to achieving that goal, um, you won't get there if it's not your passion. The money always gonna come later. So know your concept and just like she said, the hours is gonna be crazy and as long as you know what you're gonna do, just stick with it and keep on it. Say both those things is the passion which I said before and stay focused. Whatever you want to go with, stay focused and stay path. I would reiterate passion is like number one. If you don't have that, you should even start. Uh, the other part for us is never stop learning, and we live in such a cool um, age where you literally never stop learning. So for your business and life and anything, just always be open to advice, keep learning, and that way your brain, if you've got an entrepreneurial brain, you'll be you'll naturally be innovative. Yeah, I would uh, reiterate everything said here. There's all great points. So maybe add one more thing. If you're ever gonna produce something you're gonna sell, make sure your friends will buy it. If your friends don't like it, don't invest in it, and run away from that. I would reiterate the passion, and uh, truthfully, either have a really good accountant, or really know your financials yourself really, really well. Before I thank all the speakers, I just want to thank OK Crush Pad for the wine you drank tonight. Um, and if anybody is looking to have some more wine after these talks, you can purchase wine at the back, any kind of wine that they have on tap here. Feel free to stick around, mingle, talk to the speakers. If, if they're still here, you can still talk to them. 
And I want to say thank you very much to all the speakers tonight. Great job. Very inspirational. I'm sure everybody enjoyed it.